Yes, but hey, who wants a pot of coffee? I just make coffee. You want a cup of coffee? Sure, there you go. Who wants coffee? Anybody else want coffee? Who wants coffee? And now, it's time for the man with the caffeine. The new tropics for the brain. It's Coffee with Mike. Hang in, hang tight, grab your cup, and let's get this thing started. Hey everybody, welcome back to Java Chat. This is Coffee with Mike, and today I get to sit with, um, how do I say this, uh, 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 a new friend and, and colleague, because uh, he's, he's, he's got the music, man. He's got the music, and, and that's something that uh, I, one, I miss, but I, I'm, I'm happy that Brian Horner gets to join us today to share some of his experiences and some of the cool stuff that he's doing. So, Brian, thanks for coming and joining me on Java Chat. Really appreciate it. Sure. Thank you for having me. Really, really glad to be here and hang out and, and take you back to your music days a little bit as well. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're going to, we're definitely going to do that today. Um, it's, um, but for those that do know a little bit about my background, you guys knew that I played music professionally for about 15 years. So anytime somebody comes in with with music in their background that's doing business, I get really excited because it's just like, okay, what did you come up with? Let's see it. I want to see it all. I want to hear it all. <laughs> and Brian comes out with this new, he comes out with this new uh, app called uh, Craft Brood Music. Uh, and you guys will, you'll see the links down below later. We'll, you guys can see that. Um, when I took a look at it, I was just like, oh, somebody's going to help the indie the indie crowd and this is this is sick this is going to be the east and so we're going to talk about that later today but as you guys all know we have our normal three sections uh we start with where brian's from where he's been um how did he get to where he's at today so um why don't you give us a little bit of your story brother sure um i grew up in cooperstown new york which everybody knows as being the home of the baseball hall of fame. Yep. Um, but it's, it's, uh, in the summer, there's lots of people there to see the baseball hall of fame in the winter. There's about 2000, you know, population 2000, really tiny town, <laughs> one traffic light. Yeah. Nobody, and nobody goes outside. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Lots of snow. <laughs> so yeah, real tiny place. And, um, uh, you know, I, I loved it. I grew up, you know, running around in the woods and all that. Started playing saxophone when in fourth grade, when we started and, um, eventually in high school, got in a, in a band with some of my friends, basically kind of trying to be our version of Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones. Nice. Kind of a, a, a <laughs> nice. Kind of, yeah, yeah. An in instrumental jazz funk fusion thing. And yes, sir. <laughs> since it was such a small town, we kind of were big fish, you know. Yeah, that small yep, pond. That's right. It's good to be a big fish in the bowl. Yeah, it was great. So we recorded a cassette <laughs> in, in the early 90s. Nice. And, um, on two inch tape, like you and I were talking about earlier yep, yep, yep. and uh, did a bunch of gigs. And, and so I knew, you know, from early, you know, maybe my mid teens or even before that, I knew that I wanted to, to be in music, you know, uh, I thought being a full-time professional saxophone player uh, touring and doing studio work and, and doing all sorts of different things. And so I decided that the best way to pursue that was to go to school for <laughs> classical saxophone. So I went to the university of Michigan school of music um, and kind of got swept up into the the classical saxophone mainstream. <laughs> such yeah, as I feel you. And, it's cool uh, to do it though. Let me tell you. Yeah, no, it was, it was great. I, I you know, it, it helped me become a good musician. Um, Absolutely. And uh, but it, but at some point during that those years, I realized that um, you know it was it was not really musically where my heart was. It was interesting. It was challenging, but it wasn't. It taken me away from kind of what what I really wanted to do. And so I decided that after college i would move to nashville to broaden as a player you because go. you know there you go everything's happening in nashville hell yeah um and so uh i i had worked at music camps with for my saxophone professor during college and i had kind of an administrative skill set as well so i was able to get a job with uh an orchestra called the nashville chamber orchestra that was doing all sorts of different exciting classical hybrid projects and mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. met all sorts of all sorts of people and did that for a couple of years and then freelanced and taught lessons for a few years, uh, got engaged, had a chance to go work at Warner Brothers Records, went and did that for nice. uh, for four years. Yeah. And uh, it was also, I was kind of, you know, there were parts of each of these steps that I liked, but also it was either, you know, not enough time for playing or not a steady enough means to support my family or whatever. Oh, yeah. And so even at, this is challenge. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a, you know, a real hard balance to find. And, um, mm -hmm. 
So at Warner Brothers, it was kind of, you know, I learned a lot and there were some interesting things I was part of. Actually, a lot of like uh, the blue collar comedy stuff was coming out of our office at that time. Really? In fact, that gold record behind me is for Blue Collar Comedy Tour. Ah, oh, sweet. <laughs> One more for the road, yeah. Nice. Um, so, uh, you know, there was a lot of that. You know, it, it was interesting, but, but again, not my passion. And so right. I started kind of, you know, I'd been in Nashville 10 years at that point and started just kind of meeting with some of the people that I'd met along the way, just having coffee, actually. <laughs> and, uh, and I didn't know what would come out of that. I just right. thought, you know, I was kind of at a loss. And I thought, why don't I just, you know, have these conversations? And um, the singer songwriter Gretchen Peters came to who I'd met through the chamber orchestra came to one of these meetings and she kind of, you know, came in. She's like, sorry, I'm late. I was running around. I had to finish designing this poster and mail it and all this stuff. And, you know, I don't have, you know, I, I can't hire a full time person, but I, I need a part time person who knows how to do every, you know, has had the experience to know how to do everything. And yeah. I was like. That's, that's what I've amassed at this point, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, so my wife was seven months pregnant with our daughter and um, I quit my job at Warner Brothers and started my management company, Sound Artist Support. This is back in 08 now and signed Gretchen as my first client, started working with Jeff Coffin um, shortly thereafter, who was uh, in Bela Fleck and the Flecktones for many years. And that summer joined Dave Matthews Band following what? the tragic... Yeah, following the tragic accident of their founding saxophonist. Um, so those were two of my real early clients, and um, you've been doing it ever since. That's kind of my, my full-time uh, full, day job, if you will. Yep. Yeah. And, uh, and I do these other projects, whether it's, you know, there's a couple of books I've written or playing things I've done or the, the app you mentioned. Um, you know, so I ended up having that diverse musical career it's just that the saxophone isn't always in my hand. Sometimes it is, but I'm still, you know, but sometimes it isn't. And I'm working with all these people who I've been, you know, a fan of for years and years. And, um, you know, it's, it's been very, very artistically fulfilling, you know, no matter which role I'm, I'm playing. And I, I taught that, college saxophone for 15 years through all that as well. <clears throat> I, I was, that, that word fulfilling just hit my head as you were going through that. Like most people, probably dream of being able to do that the, the musician side of things we all dream to be able to do that to be able to get to a point where we're either producing or managing or something of that nature it's kind of the epitome of our of our field of our profession um some of us are just super creatives and we're happy just doing that and some of us are more fulfilled being able to do things like what you've done um i don't know if i could ever yeah. done the management thing um I, I know that i was doing the promotion and and producing for a while um but it just didn't last i didn't have i didn't have enough structure and i didn't have enough mm -hmm. um i don't think it was really where i belonged i mean it was mm -hmm. it was rough um but being able to see somebody in our field get out there and just crank it and feel feel good cranking it that's for me that's like yeah that's awesome i'm i'm totally totally stoked about that not only that but you're stepping into the entrepreneurial realm with this app deal so that's that's pretty awesome too um you said you wrote you yeah. wrote a couple books i know you did i know you did a manual you said earlier but have you've actually written a book yeah yeah i wrote a few years ago i wrote a book called uh living the dream the morning after music school uh which um you know is about the intersection of of the dream we have and why we get into this and the realities that we inevitably face you know after leaving music school it's mostly aimed at at music majors um sort of a, a it takes fundamental performance skills and draws these parallels into the, the business realm you know so these are things you've already worked on in the practice room and if you think about it this way they're things that can help you in your career as well and mm -hmm. then we did as uh, i co-wrote a, a, a version of that for art students and for drama students so it's it's, it's kind of a <clears throat> it's, it's a perspective book Basically, it, it it gives them perspective on how to how, how to transition out of school into life. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, there aren't enough yeah. of them either. Good. Yeah, Good. and I give lectures about that, which is a lot of fun talking to students about you know what they're anxious about and wondering about, and you know what's how do I move to a new city? Is there a certain city I need to do? How do you meet people? You know all the all that stuff. Some of those are the most. It's it's interesting in the business world those are considered basic skills and yet those basic skills never seem to be taught in our realm as far as the music goes i mean we're taught to go practice get really good how to write yeah. music and all that stuff but 
when it comes time to get out there and actually do do something with it, they don't teach that stuff. I, I mean, maybe they are now, but back in our days when we were when we were younger, I don't remember any classes on that. Yeah, they're just starting to, and they'll bring in somebody like like me to speak. But yeah, yeah. there's not really enough resources um, around that, and there's all these intangibles that really are, may, make or break the person trying to have that career. You know, everybody's a good player if they're making sure. a serious go of it. You know, they can play sure. fast, they can play in tune, they have a tone, but um, you know, they don't necessarily know the importance of how they present themselves when they make an outreach to somebody. How they how how bad it is if they're late to a gig or a rehearsal or you know, or just being a, a good hang, you know, it's kind of like, there's somebody else, you know, who's going to be fun to hang around with, who's also good. So, yeah, yeah that's, uh, you know, that's, assholes that's, need not apply. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, we, we play by the no household rule, so it's, it's a good thing. I don't know if you read that book, but that's a good book. Um, I've seen it, yeah, that's certainly the rule I, I live by. That's a, it's a great rule to live by, actually. But we, we did have, um, I've, I've got to hang out with a few cool musicians in my day. And some of them were just the most chill dudes to hang out with. And some of them were some of the most obnoxious sons of <laughs> ever hung out with you. Like, and I'm going, did you really just say that out loud? <laughs> you, you do realize yeah. you're in Hawaii and there's people around here that are hearing this. And that's not exactly a smart thing to say. Uh, yeah. it just, I guess it just depends. Um, of course, back then I didn't have any control over it. But it, 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 I think throughout life, if we play that no asshole rule, um, we find ourselves with better crowds. I think that's right. Yeah. And I don't know whether it's the, the kind of music I've ended up, you know, I've, I've gravitated in, in my professional life toward the music that I, you know, uh, have always been a fan of, you know, acoustic music, cross genre music, um, more independent off the beaten path stuff. And those people in my experience have been, you know, some of the most fascinating, most generous, uh, you know, um, uh, two-way street kind of people, yeah. you know, that I've ever met. That's it. I, to add on to that, and I was just thinking about this, it, I, was, I was, two things hit my head. The first one was this kid on TikTok who nails it with a space sax, and I'm going to have to send him, I'm going to have mm. to send him his video. Yeah. He some pretty cool stuff. Um, and it, and it's, it's definitely not, not your traditional, um, but it's, it's pretty damn cool. Interesting. Uh, the, and I forgot the other one. So brain fart. Anyway, <laughs> it, it happens. What music are you mostly affinitized to these days? You know, these days it's, it's, I go in, I go in two week listening cycles because we re release a podcast every two weeks. With a different <laughs> <artist. laughs> nice. nice. And so we do an interview and then, and then immediately start prepping for the next episode and uh, taking a really deep dive on. And these are all artists that I've already signed to craft group music. So I've already, you know, I'm familiar with their stuff, but for the podcast, obviously we're really, yeah. Uh, my co-host and I are really kind of getting deep into it. So that's, it's really actually been a, a lot of fun. We just, uh, we're about to, to record episode 13. So it's, it's been about six months now. And, uh, so, you know, for example, right now we're about to interview the cellist singer songwriter, Helen Jolet from new Orleans nice. and her music runs the gamut from, you know, beautiful singer songwriter to, um, to French chanson, to more almost classical, to straight up jazz, to stuff with like house beats in it, um, and like a chanted almost rap thing. I mean, it's you know, even even by craft root music standards, it's diverse. <laughs> you yeah, know? I would say so it's goodness. really fascinating. That's a that's a that's a very wow. That's almost full spectrum. It, it's close to full spectrum. If you're yeah, there's not a lot that, that she's not covering. Yeah. Um, and so I, there's a creativity just in that of saying, how are we going to, what is the conversation around this going to be? You know, you know, that's its own each, each episode. It's like, be, be careful, be careful with the question of what's your inspiration. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How long do we have? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Which is really great, you know, and hopefully makes for some interesting listening. I, I last, really last time we interviewed Howard Levy from Bela Fleck and the Fleck Tones and you know, just again, the breadth of his material oh, is, yeah. is oh, off yeah. the charts. We decided to focus on his classical music, which made for a really interesting way to explore that. So I'm sort of, you know, and then, and then in, in, you know, for it's all pleasure, but I guess for pleasure, not work stuff, you know, I'm, I'm in a big jazz phase, Miles Davis, you know, trying to work all, all the way through, you know, all that stuff. And there's pl plenty there too. Yeah. 
Yes, there's a ton. Um, I, I get stuck on um, uh, Rosenberg Trio Django, uh, you know, that kind of music, more of the, yeah. the, okay. the, the what do they call that, the gypsy, gypsy, gypsy jazz. jazz. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. um, and only because like Stoch Lowe and, and all those guys and how, how they are able to pull these bloody arpeggio patterns off on their keyboard, on their fingerboards without even looking at yeah. me. Yeah, yeah. It's just all patterns. And I, it, it just, you know, couldn't tell how club San Francisco, those guys, yep. uh, you just, they're just, um, to me, it's like, I drool when I hear that kind of music because I, I know how much work they've put into it. And I know how much comes out of their guitars. You can't get that unless you really know what the hell you're doing. And, yeah, and like somebody who's really great at speaking. You know, it's just, exactly. It's their language, and they've internalized it. Yeah, boy, have they internalized it! And and then again, going into other music as well. You know, listening to some of the some of the smooth jazz, which is why I'm excited about craft beat music because I want to see what you guys got too. Um, I'm sure there's a ton of great stuff coming through there. So you have the management company, the and the app's already active, correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay, and they can find it on Google Play and on i and on um, uh, the App Store. The app store thank you i can just yes. remember that i'm not an iphone guy okay yeah i just uh, i know i should be because i'm a musician but whatever i don't want to hear it um, <laughs> <laughs> i won't try to convert you during yeah this. Uh, but trust me everybody <laughs> keeps trying to and it's like you should do iphone i'm like yeah whatever um <laughs> are there any is there anything else that you have in the in play right i mean you're, you're obviously speaking you're 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 doing those things you're doing management is there anything else that you're doing on top of that or i mean the, the, there's been one other big project that's coming to fruition, and that's an, another book project, which is a, a saxophone methods textbook. Colleges have methods courses for music education majors to learn to play and teach the instrument that's not their primary instrument. And so I've been working with Allison Adams, the professor of saxophone at the University of Tennessee, to write, uh, to kind of write a new a textbook for the 21st century on that topic. And, um, and that's been a, a huge project, very, again, very fulfilling and um, it's kind of, it's an interesting thing when you say, okay, I've been playing saxophone for 30 years, um, and I, and I need to put, and teaching it for 20 years and I need to put all of that knowledge. Now we're going to put it all down and organize it and, you know, get it out there. So the mind, um, the mind dump on that has to be immense. I mean, yeah, we're, we're talking years of just consistent going at it and going at it. How do you translate that? I mean, that, that, that's, I would think that's the biggest challenge is translating all of that. Yeah. Um, well, it's stuff that as a teacher, you've, you've verbalized this stuff, you know, in, in lessons many times over. And she and I have both taught at all levels from beginners. So we've said those things and, you know, through high school students and college students. And so, um, you know, it's sort of, uh, yeah, how to translate it. It's just about finding the organization and, you know, kind of trying to figure out how to, how to split it up in, in a way that, and serve it up in a way that, that will work for students in a six week course. Uh, yeah. But yeah, certainly a big project and um, a lot to get your head around. I bet, I bet, but I'm gonna be totally worth it. I'm sure when it finally finishes. As a musician- yeah, so those are the big three things though, right now. <laughs> as a musician, <laughs> what's your most memorable performance? Your, memorable. The, one, the, one that you, the one that you just absolutely were like, Fuck, I'm in the zone. This is so good. I don't want this to end. That one. Yeah. Uh, I want to give multiple answers. <laughs> um, one, Spoken one, like a true artist. <laughs> <laughs> one would be um, when I was in college, the University of Michigan Symphony Band did a tour and we played in Carnegie Hall. And not <laughs> only was that, you know, so that was amazing. Yes. Obviously, for obvious reasons. You, there, there's an energy on the, in the, on the stage. You can almost feel the history of the room. And, and the performance, so it wasn't only the place, the performance kind of matched matched it and was really great. Um, and, uh, you know, but then there's other times too where uh, I'm thinking of a performance I did, you know, those guys I mentioned from Cooperstown. Yeah. Actually, one of them, the guitar player is my co-host on the podcast. He's in oh, Seattle. Oh, cool. And uh, we're all still friends and we still play occasionally. We, we played again 10 years later in Cooperstown and then Aaron, my co-host, Aaron Stamen, um, had spent time in Armenia and gotten to know this Armenian folk rock guy, Gore Mikhatarian, nice. who's an amazing artist, and um, has started recording with him. And, and whenever, or occasionally when they play in the States, 
we'll play with them. So we played in Nashville together. We played in Boston and that performance in Boston with Gore comes to mind. Um, you know, I don't know any Armenian, but the music, you know, is I can totally immerse in. And I remember looking back in our, our drummer, Orion, you know, who, who gave me for our, on our 10th birthday, he gave me Billy Joel's glass houses, you know, which was another kind of fall in love moment. Oh yeah. <laughs> and so I look back at him in Boston and, and he's singing, you know, singing along without missing a beat, singing all the Armenian lyrics. He doesn't know any Armenian either, you know, but it was, it was one of those things where we were just all, you know, in the music. And so that comes to mind as another one, but there's a lot, you know, there's a lot of those moments if you're lucky. Those are, those are, yeah. If you're, if you're, if you're lucky, you get to, you get to hang out. And if you guys are hearing this, it's, it's not about, you know, I worked with Warner brothers or it's not about, I got to be on stage with such a celebrity. It's when you're, when you're an actual artist, whatever art you're, you perform in and practice, it's about the flow that you find between people. It's about the pocket as far as part of it. And then the ability to support somebody else that might be doing a solo or might be singing or whatever, but that total flow that, that, that matters. Uh, and you can experience it as a listener even. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it, it, in fact, that only proves that the artists are in flow is when the listener can in, immerse yeah. themselves in it and go, whoa, that yeah. was awesome. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I honestly think that's our intent as, as musicians. When we do that, when we're on stage, as much as we're doing it for us, we really want somebody else to feel what we're feeling. And when we can turn, when we can turn sound into color, pff, it's a done deal. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that's wonderful. Yeah. All right, cool. Um, we're gonna take a short 30 second break. We're, when we come back, we're gonna talk about what, what inspires and what motivates Brian. And I'm, I'm sure there's gonna be some cool stories behind that one too. So we'll be back in 30 seconds. And we're back here, Java Chat, hanging out with Brian Horner. Uh, Brian, what's the name of your podcast again? The Craft Brood Music Podcast. Craft Brood Music Podcast. And guys, if you didn't know, he's, he's also the, uh, the creator and originator of the Craft Brood Music app. If you haven't gotten it make sure you get it there's going to be a link down below it'll be in the description on anchor as well so make sure you download that app because if you want to hear what's real and what's up and coming or what's next that's where you want to go hang out it'll be easier for you to you know what before we get into the inspiration this, describe that whole thing we were kind of talking about that in the beginning why it was created the craft brew music and how it how it relates to the concept of music i mean it's yeah. you know, the craft brew thing the the craft brood music thing how does that how did how did you do that yeah so um i mentioned that i you know gravitate toward artists that are kind of outside the mainstream yeah they tend to fall across or between genres um none of this by the way is a particularly uh good thing commercially <laughs> you yeah. know yeah it doesn't make anybody's job easier yeah um, as they all know um <clears throat> but uh but that's what i've kind of devoted my my career too, because it's what I love. There, there's definitely ways to get richer. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, it's, it's what I love to work with. So one time I was on the road with, um, it was kind of a weird trip. I think both these things happened on the same trip or on very close trips. Um, I was on the road with an electric violinist client of mine, Tracy Silverman. And he was he was traveling with the percussionist and Flectones member, uh, Future Man, Roy Future Man Wooten. They were playing together and we were hanging out and somebody asked me, you know, what kind of music I worked with as a manager, just off the cuff. I said, well, it's kind of, it's kind of craft, craft music. Um, and cause that made perfect sense to me. There's craft sure. beer, craft bourbon and, you know, craft coffee and all this stuff. But so that, you know, made sense to me. Pleasant surprise was that nobody was really kind of using that in the music space. And so I, either on the same trip, like I said, or, or right nearby, I was on a plane with somebody and, um, who started asking me if I ever used investors in my work. And I literally said to the guy, you know, why you got some money you want to give away? <laughs> and I just, and, uh, and I was like, well, actually I work with this group of investors and they're real estate investors, but you know, they like, you know, my job is to bring them unusual projects sometimes. And so um, I did not end up working with them, but um, it did get me, you know, I went home and I sat down and I said, you know, what, what could I build for my clients if I had money to work with? Right. Um, just as a brainstorming exercise and, and having that craft music thing pop into my head around the same time, that's where that idea was, was born. And, uh, a, another good friend of mine from Cooperstown, coincidentally, I have friends, you know, made 
after <laughs> I left high school, but but I also have a lot of friends from back in those days. And my next door neighbor, Peter Reedhead, um, is uh, is in the business world, uh -huh. and um, you know I let him know about this idea, and he liked it. And and I I said, you know, I need somebody to help me who, who's a business person. Yeah. Um, and so he came on board as a as a partner and uh, helped you know build a business plan and and all those things that I didn't really know how to do, and um, you know as well as kind of pushing back on on certain ideas and being you know being a valuable other voice in the room. Yeah. And um, so that's yeah. So we we it's a discovery platform. It, it's a it's a streaming service based on the based on an app. You subscribe to it, five bucks a month, fifty dollars a year, uh, and we. Um, you know, we call it the app that streams better music for serious listeners. It's uh, it's meant to show you stuff that exists elsewhere, but that you probably wouldn't find. And you might have a, a contemporary string ensemble, and then next is an Americana band, and then next is a is a uh, a jazz artist. And I'm using these labels loosely because you know they're not perfect fits in in most cases, um, and that's intentional. Yeah. And, that, and that difference is, um, is intentional. So it's music that's substantial and, and can be challenging, but it's also, um, you know, accessible and rocks. So I, you know, and it's, of course, it's all subjective. It's all me getting sure. to decide. <laughs> yeah, sure. But, uh, but that's, that's the, that's the uh, intention. We want to bring people in and, and I think, you know, so you will, you will not like some of it and you'll like a lot of it. And I think you'll end up with uh, leaving with broader, uh, sonic horizons than you came in with. I agree. I one of the biggest things that I was always told as a musician when I was young um, was don't just listen to what you like. Yeah. Go find the stuff and and get your head and emotions wrapped around everything so you know what you do and what you don't. But at the same time, you broaden your perspective so you understand what other kinds of music are out there. Otherwise, yeah. you're you're cheating yourself of a true experience of what music can do. Yeah, you don't know uh, what you don't know. It's like yeah, yeah. You don't, it's like food or anything else. You know, you. Yeah, I don't like Brussels sprouts. I I tried that. It doesn't work. <laughs> um, but you you mentioned something like the running into this realm because there's so much crossover that it's not really good commercial, uh, commercially, yeah. uh, which is unfortunate. The, the the way the music industries, the commercial side of the music industry went, um, when we were kids. It was the big fat executive with the cigar sitting in a room going, oh, let's take a shot at it. If we make some money, great. If we don't, we don't. They were, they were like the original investors of music. Mm -hmm. And then eventually they started hiring guys that you know, were retiring out of music. And those guys became the, the, the talent AEs. And all of a sudden it started, it started changing. They started gatekeeping. Right. And, they start, and they started planning around who, I mean, dude, how many, how many groups did you, do you and I remember throughout our lives as as musicians we'd listen to songs that we just like how the hell did they get on the radio that's sure. fuck that. yeah yeah or or jesus really they use auto-tune and yet they're making millions okay you know something's wrong here <laughs> right you know but you're you're in a space where this is back to the old the old executives with the cigars going hey let's take a shot and see what happens and and it looks like it can pay off. While I get what you're saying, commercially, it probably won't pay off as much as it could. It can still pay off well. Yeah, it can, it, it can work. It can be viable. Yeah, it can work very well because now you've given the other genres a chance, so to speak, to get out there. I mean, you're out to mainstream, bro. I mean, if you're on Google Play and, and App Store, you're kind of there. Am I wrong? Well, you got to get users. You know, you got to get. Oh, I get that part. That's. But yes, yes, marketing. you're in the same. Well, and that's and that and to that point, you know, there's for all the doom and gloom about the music business, nobody buys music, nobody this, nobody that. The, the kind of the scenario, the gatekeepers you're talking about are the major label scenarios, and there's fewer and fewer of those, and and um, right. and it's harder <laughs> to get into that game. But at the same time, because of the internet, because of being able to be on iTunes, no matter who you are, or Apple Music, or Spotify, or all these places, um, you know, like it's sort of like having an app, you know, it's harder to make an app, but yeah, yeah, you know, it's, you can, you can be entrepreneurial and get your music out, even if you are, you know, whatever you might do, you know, so in some ways, uh, there are, there are more opportunities, you know? Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's plenty of challenges, but there's also, you know, 
in the seventies, you know, there wasn't a way for somebody with some really, you know, out idea to yeah. put out an album that was, would be accessible to anybody in the world who wanted to find it. You know, well, you remember, you remember back in the sixties, how bad people talked against jazz. All the all the all the big celebrities were like, "Jazz, what the hell is that shit? That stuff's nasty. It's terrible." Blah blah blah. And I'm, I'm, I I couldn't believe I was hearing it from from artists that I like listening to. And I was like, "No, oh, no, 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 no. How's that possible?" And yet you come forward to today, and it's like, that's mainstream. It's been mainstream sure. forever. You know, it's it's just part of life. Yeah. We're looking at it. I look at your app as a as a the new path to what's going to be normal, simply because these artists are there when with the right backing with your your management the right marketing and enough of a user base i I can't see it not becoming its own arena or its own it's not a genre like you said it's crossover but it's going to become its own arena it's going to become its own market marketplace if you will that's what i see i'm always looking five ten years down the road that's kind of how i think but that's what yeah and, and because of you know there was a book called the long tail um I'm blanking on the artist's name. Chris Chris Anderson, I think, is the author. Okay. Um, that, uh, you know, I, I think the basic concept, and it's been a while since I've read it, so apologies to Chris Anderson if I misstate this, <laughs> but I think the idea being that in, in the in world of internet um, commerce, e-commerce, there is, you know, it used to be that you had to make all of your you know, 80% of your earnings from the 20% uh, of the products that were the most yeah. popular. Yeah. And now we can, we can, you know, uh, monetize all of those things that are under that long tail and that cumulatively that's valuable. So what, what craft group music is and what the music that, that comprises it is, is very niche stuff. You know, it is not going to be, you know, making Beyonce look over her shoulder and, and be concerned yeah. about sharing a stage, but, um, but there is an there, I believe there are enough people interested in it to make it viable, both for the company and for our artists, which by the way, we split our income down the middle with our artists. Um, it was designed to be an artist friendly platform. I designed it as a manager. And so, um, you know, I believe there's enough there. There's enough interest in that, even though it's, it's, uh, it's a niche thing. I think if we can find those people, there are enough of them in that, you know, under that <clears throat> philosophy. Consider how much <clears throat> the younger generations, and, th and this is in support of what you just, what you're hoping for. Consider the, the music, um, whether it's EDM or otherwise, that the younger generations are listening to. They're using a lot of different parts of other genres to drag into EDM. And I've recently, I've recently been seeing like on TikTok, I've been watching some of these, some of this younger generation goes, I found the original and they play the original for as long as it can go, you know, 15 or 60 seconds or whatever. And they all pile on it. Holy crap. I didn't know it was this. I never thought it was this. And I'm looking at it going, huh? Yeah. Yeah. But, but, but that just confirms to me what you're hoping for is probably going to happen because while they love what they love, they also like to hear where it's from and that gets their attention enough that they'll stop and they'll listen to the whole thing just to go, well, that was cool. Now I get it. Um, there, there was a trend where it was a sped up track of one of Aerosmith's old songs. And I can't remember which one it is, but um, somebody found the original song and posted it. It's viral. Right. And there's a new hit. Yeah. It's a, it, Aerosmith just got a hit all over again. From <laughs> yeah. the fucking seventies. Um, it, and it's and it 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 just reaffirms humans will be humans. They want to hear music. They want to hear tones. They want to feel tones. They want to know. They want to know it. And if you're bringing if you're bringing in the stuff that you're bringing in, they're gonna want to know it. I, and I agree. I think there's enough. I think there's more than enough of a market. Like you said, it's just getting the users to pick it up. That's really what it comes down to. Um, well. Get back on track here. We talk about inspiration, motivation, but obviously something inspired you to do this, which you kind of talked about already. What other things motivate you and, and keep you inspired to keep pushing in this direction? Um, mentors, other books that you might have read, or or maybe even the artists that you manage. How? Yeah. Where does that come from? 
Well, it's actually, I would say, I can speak to all, uh, you know, each of those things. Um, but my, my teachers that I had both in my high school band director, Tom Ives was, you know, you know, a, um, almost maniacally enthusiastic about, uh, you know, about yeah. miles, gotta love those whatever guys. it might be, you know, you gotta love those guys, man. Yeah. And so, and then my saxophone professor in college, Donald Sinta was, you know, uh, everything, uh, he brought the highest of standards to everything from, you know, from playing music to, you know, raising his kids to, to everything. And so, um, that no matter what you go into from that, you know, kind of embracing that level of, of, uh, it's not necessarily perfection as much as just, you know, the highest standard you can possibly bring to it, um, you know, is going to, is going to be uh, beneficial. Um, and so I, I think, um, and then as far as entrepreneurially, you know, starting the businesses I've started, um, there was one book that stands out called the hundred dollar startup by, uh, I've heard that book. The Guile Bow is the last time. I think Chris Guile Bow. Um, yeah, that's correct. Chris Guile Bow, the hundred dollar startup. And it's basically saying, you know, it doesn't take, uh, you know, it's doable to start yeah. a business that's built on a couple of things. One of which is that it's something that you're passionate about, you know, allow yourself to be an expert at something that you, you know, that you in fact are by virtue of your passion for it. Yeah. And second of all, if you lead by uh, striving to help someone with this passion, um, then, then you can, you know, think of ways to make a business out of that. And then it doesn't have to cost a lot to do that. You know, for example, my business costs like a laptop. I think that might be it, <laughs> you know, Perfect. to start, not the, not the app. That's different, <laughs> <laughs> but my management, uh, book. So, um, I'm my management company. Um, you know, so that was one, just a concept that kind of, um, a lot of, a lot of several things opened up when I said, you know, um, it's okay to, to not think about what I don't know and haven't done, but to think about what I do know and have done and say, you know, I'm an expert at this. I'm an expert at using creativity to make a career that's unlike, unlike any other, not in terms of it being more successful, but simply that it's unique. Um, and so that led to me, you know, kind of allowing myself to share that experience in the book that I wrote, which led to me being able to share that information with students. And of course, all of this is helping me earn a living as well. Sure. Um, so that's a big concept, you know, that, that I, I think about a lot in, in, a, in some different ways. Victor Wooten, the, the electric bass player from the Flectones wrote a great book called The Music Lesson. And the, the, his second book just came out called The Spirit of Music. Um, both of those are amazing. They're sort of like music. They're, they're, I read somewhere that he had always been asked to write, you know, a, a book about how to play the bass. Like, how do you, how, how are you the musician that you are? And how he chose to do that was in novel form. You know, it's a story that he, he talks about some of these philosophies and principles. And uh, I thought, the, I haven't read the second book yet. I will shortly, but the first book I thought was just amazing. I'm going to have to go dig into that one because yeah, it, it just, most people don't realize just exactly how important a bass is in music and having, oh, yeah. the, having the bottom to hold the foundation. Everybody thinks it all, it all leverages off the drums. It's like, mm, not, not, not quite. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's hard to beat a good bass player. Yeah, it is. Uh, it's, I, my, one of my music teachers, um, he had his, his degrees in, in big band comp and, and um, I'm sorry, comp and big band arrangement were the two that he had. And, and he became like one of the only level four pro tools guys that didn't have a PhD or some shit like that. We used to go out on gigs together and one night the guitar player didn't show up and he had to play the whole gig by himself with just the bass. <laughs> Three hour gig, yeah. just the bass. And I was like, how did that work? He goes, fine. Hold it off. Hold it off. It was no big deal. Just as long as you know what you're doing. And then there were, there were times where we would play together and we'd be on stage and he'd look at me and he'd go, wrong chord. And the moment I hear that, I said, oh shit, I'm going to hear it when I get in the back. I know it already. <laughs> but he was, he was very kind about it. When we get into the back and he goes, what were you playing? 
and I would tell him whatever chord it was I was playing. He goes, try this chord next time. And we literally play the song again the next set because most of the crowd wasn't paying attention. This was for Luau, so we could get away with anything. Okay. Almost. And we played the song again, and I'd try it. And all of a sudden, he'd, he'd look at me, and he goes, you get it? I'm like, yeah. He goes, good. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it, it, it's he had that kind of foundation in his head that when he played his bass, he knew exactly what was coming through. Yeah. Um, and, and he was able to – we even manipulated certain songs where we weren't supposed to play certain chords, but because he changed what he was playing and told me what to play, and it was like, that actually worked too. What the hell? Yeah, I, I'm yeah. gonna go find that book. That's definitely awesome. Who, out of your out of your your stable, who's the most inspiring? Uh, that is a hard question. Um, I love asking hard. There's questions. yeah. Well, there's a couple different ways to, to answer it. <laughs> I'm taking a lot of liberties with your questions. Um, <laughs> you know, there's who's the most inspiring musically, and then who's the most inspiring? Uh, you know, so, maybe from a business standpoint. So so let let's. Pull them both. Pull a story from yeah. both. We have time. So a couple. I mean, there's, um, yeah, there's there's the people I work with, if I do say so myself, and as a compliment to them, are all very impressive. Um, Jeff Coffin, the saxophonist I mentioned earlier, Grammy, you know, multi Grammy winner. He's in Dave Matthews Band. Was in Bela Fleck and the Flecktones. Is also one of the most involved and in command, you know, self managers that that I have ever met and worked That's with, cool. you know, he's totally, you know, and even the great, the last year has been a great example. He's been, you know, hasn't been touring, but has put out multiple albums written, you know, multiple books. Um, you know, we'll, we'll talk, you know, have, if we hadn't talked in a few days and, you know, I'll be like, wait, is this a new book I hadn't heard about that you were <laughs> like, what's, you know, it's hard to keep up. So, um, and by the same token, uh, Tracy Silverman, the electric violinist I mentioned, is working, has used this time to develop an entire suite of, of video and, and online courses and all of the marketing behind it, awesome. you know, and so I've supported both of them in these things, but I mean, they're, um, you know, just at the helm and, and fully involved. Musically, I don't know if I could pick one. Um, that's you know, I, I work with my artists because I'm, yeah, it's our, it's yeah our, I'm in love with all of them musically, you know. Yeah. Um, but I will say that, that you know, because of, and this is probably, well, it's true of, of probably maybe most jobs at some time, but I, I feel like because of the kind of music I work with, it can often feel like pushing a boulder up a hill, you know. It's not, you, there's a lot of no's, there's a lot of yeah. Yeah. trying new things, which is not easy to get people to do. Um and so one thing that I've noticed without fail that can inspire and re-energize is to go see my artists live. Um, and sometimes a surprising amount of time goes by. I mean, obviously lately, but even before that, a surprising amount of time goes by without that happening. And, um, you know, either somebody will be, I lived in Nashville for 20 years until a, a couple of years ago. Um, now I'm in the Atlanta area. If somebody's here, I'll come see them. Certainly in Nashville, whenever they happen to play at home, I would go see them. And occasionally I go travel and see them. And um, and that really, you know, fills the fills the gas tank again. Yeah. And uh, it makes it, you know, it, you're like, oh, of course I'm going to push that boulder up the hill. And I'm going to get it to the top of the hill. You know. <laughs> after so, after hearing that, yeah, it's worth it. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's some of the best. That's wonderful. Uh, guys, we're going to take another 30-second break. We're going to come back and we'll chat a little bit about what uh, what's in the future for Brian. You guys have been hearing a lot about one thing, but he's got a couple other things going on too, including a podcast. So we'll talk about that when we come back about 30 seconds. All right. We're back. Java Chat sitting here with Brian Horner, uh, musician, composer, author, entrepreneur, app creator. Fuck, what else you want to put on that, dude? <laughs> I don't know. My, I'm almost out of Java. <laughs> You're almost out of Java. Yeah, I, I ran out of Java a while ago. I, I need to make some. Um, tomorrow, man. What does tomorrow look like? Tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow's going to be catching up on the, the, the finalizations of this saxophone book I mentioned. Uh -huh. um, and uh, we're setting up a, a Patreon uh campaign to support the podcast nice the craft brood music podcast so that's probably who, 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 who comes to that podcast who do you who do you interview on that we interview the craft brood music artists so awesome. the people that i feature in the app um we we go in depth with on the podcast so okay. we've been running about 45 minutes to an hour 
on those episodes, um, which I had originally envisioned kind of a 30 minute episode, but it's, it's hard to really go deep, which we've discovered we like to do and they, and the artists like to do, and we like to play a lot of music. And so, um, you know, that it's, uh, that's where it's ended up. And, uh, we've been really excited. We've, uh, uh, my co-host again, my, my longtime friend, Aaron, and I've really enjoyed doing it, talking to some of our, our heroes, people we were listening to and, you know, during band rehearsals in 1993. <laughs> um, so it's been, you know, it's been really, really fun. I've been pleased with what we've been able to produce and people seem to like it. So, uh, again, it's another thing to try to get, try to get ears on it, just like we're trying to get eyes and ears on the app and, um, you know, push the boulder up the hill, but it's, uh, it's what we do. So, but yeah, that's the, you know, that's my, the, the podcast and the app are really, uh, a, a, a main focus for me. Gotcha. Gotcha. That, uh, that textbook, is that only going to be going through, uh, educational or is that going to be something that's offered up on Amazon or something or that I think will, will be a pretty straight college textbook okay. with a, with a publisher. We have a publisher looking at it and if they don't take it, somebody else, I hope will, but yeah, that'll be mostly hands off after I'm done with it. That's okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. Sometimes like, um, I have a buddy of mine who's, um, a drumming instructor and he created a whole series around, um, what do you call it? Caribbean beats. Oh, cool. We got a whole bunch of manuals and you can get them both. You can get them through college and then you can get them independently too. Yeah. And that's my, <laughs> my other book was kind of like that. It was sort of a textbook, but it was also available on Amazon and people, you know, I think any musician, hopefully my, my intention was to have that be useful to anybody, but yeah, this new one will be a ton of work to totally, you know, dot all the, what do you dot the I's and cross the T's. Yeah. Yep. Um, yep. But you. after that, it'll, it'll go hopefully into colleges and live its life. Sweet. Co going back to the pot, uh, to the, not the podcast, but back to the app. How many listeners, how many downloads do you have so far? Uh, several, you know, several hundred. Okay. So it really has okay. just began. It, it really yeah. Yeah. Began. It's almost like okay. it's been a soft launch almost in beta and we're really trying to move it out of that. Okay. Um, who, who's our listener or our user? Um, I think of it as being the craft demographic. So it's, it's the person who, um, you know, I, I don't think of it in terms of standard demographic terms like age 18 to 35, although it's probably, you know, I don't know, 30 to 30 to 55. Um, but, but I think of it more in terms of behaviorally, uh, in terms of behavior, I think it's the sort of person who, when they're visiting a city wants to drink the local beer. Yeah. Uh, when they go out to dinner, they want to go out to a local place rather than a chain, mm -hmm. you know, uh, chain, uh, music, is available readily available yeah you know and you have to to dig a little bit more to find non-chain stuff and that's what we're yeah. trying to shine a spotlight on um and we're not you know we're not going to compete with spotify or apple music or uh pandora or you know we're not going to be budweiser but we're going to you know provide a, a interesting substantial alternative for somebody who wants a really kind of unique listening experience i think I think it still has a great future. Um, I remember when Spotify first came out, they were kind of being viewed as this, the Pandora competitor and they blew up. Um, obviously sure. they're, they play more in the, they play more in the, uh, the mainstream realm, but yeah, you know, there's, there is that unserved area and you're, you're bringing something to it. So I, I can see where it can do really well. Um, <clears throat> people can find you on a number of places. If they're looking for, for your music, I believe it's brianhornermusic.com. Is that correct? Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're going to talk a lot about that. I'm a classical saxophone player. I've got uh, a recording out and there's info on the books there and you can hear some music. So yeah. Awesome. And then the podcast is, if somebody searches out for it, it is the Craft Brood Podcast. The Craft Brood Music Podcast. Music Podcast. It's available Craft on most Brood. podcast platforms. Okay, cool. Uh, and then obviously, if you guys want to get the Craft Brood Music app, App Store, Google Play, go grab a cop, uh, go grab the app, and start listening, you guys. I mean, that's it's 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 a place where you're going to find something different, and, and you're going to be able to experience new experiences in music. And there's a two week free trial on both the subscription levels, and you can also oh, hear sweet. hear a little sample on craftbrewmusic.com as well to kind of you know a, a a song is worth at least a thousand words. Oh, all day, <laughs> so, all day, all you know, day. Yeah, so you can hear what hear what we're talking about and uh, and read a little bit about you know how it all works and 
see what the app's about. And, uh, and again, there's a free trial. So hopefully it's a no lose situation. I, I'm totally excited for you, man. This is, it's, it's huge to me that anybody even thought about doing this and I, I really wish you all the best with it. Um, you. guys, if you're, that. yeah, absolutely. If you're watching this on, <clears throat> on YouTube, don't forget all, all the stuff we've been talking about. The links will all be down in the comments. Uh, if you got any questions for Brian, go ahead and post, uh, you know, your questions down below. Uh, I'm, I'm sure because he's going to get the, he's going to get the links. So he'll, he'll be able to see it. And he'll be able to answer it better though. Uh, go to his website, send him an email or follow him on us on social. I'm sure he's got at least an Instagram uh, and a Facebook. Yeah. I, so I, there's all those things. Yeah. <clears throat> so, you know, reach out from there and, and if you're a musician, ask questions. Absolutely. You got a wealth of knowledge in the guy sitting right here to my left you might as well ask um brian thanks again man. I, I really appreciate you coming in and, and sharing your story sharing sharing your, your business savvy and all this guy all the great stuff man. i, I enjoyed it thanks a lot for having me really fun fun to bring chat. back some good memories brother you certainly bring back some good memories good good um we'll, we'll have to have you come back though uh, to do a spot check on how things are going and you know yeah where things are at with uh, the podcast and with the with the app and stuff uh, so we'd love to have sounds, you. sounds great awesome all right guys well if you're listening if you're first off if you're watching on youtube don't forget there's a subscribe button there if you're not subscribed what the hell hit the damn button get the button get the bell <laughs> next to it too. hit the button hit the hit, push the damn button <laughs> who remembers that line uh don't forget the bell next to it because that gives you the notification when we get another awesome guest like this to join us here on java chat if you're listening to us on any of the um podcast platforms make sure you either download it or subscribe uh if you're listening to us on anchor.fm we could use your support feel free to drop some for us um we always end these the same you know we're very thankful that anyone any one of you makes the time and takes the time to come and listen to try to get whatever golden nuggets you get out of this uh, and by the way if you got a friend that you think this might be relevant to they might be in this one in particular they might be a musician they might be an entrepreneur share it with them you know send them the link and say hey this was pretty cool and it's brief enough and it gives you plenty of good stuff to chew on send it to them let them let them take a listen as well we appreciate everything that you guys do so stay up stay safe stay healthy and live for myself coffee with mike and for brian horner ciao for now For more information on Java Chat, visit www.javachatpodcast.com. You've been listening to Coffee with Mike on Java Chat. Tune in weekly to this podcast for the next episode. You can also download or subscribe today on your favorite podcast platform. A production of Oasis Media Group, LLC. Located in Las Vegas, Nevada. Copyright 2019. All rights reserved.